Did an innocent man die for a crime he didn't commit? Last night, I'm sure all of you were watching the coverage here on MSNBC and were horrified by the spectacle of what we saw. Troy Anthony Davis was executed by the state of Georgia. He was pronounced dead at 11.08 p.m. Eastern Time. Davis was convicted in the 1989 murder of an off-duty police officer named Mark McPhail. And for two decades, Davis sat on death row despite questions surrounding his guilt. Davis maintained his innocence until literally his last breath. Davis said, I want to talk to the McPhail family. And he said, despite the situation you're in, I did not take your son, father, brother. I want you to dig deeper into this case so you will really see what happened. My heart goes out to the McPhail family, but we've got to ask the question, was justice done here? Seven out of the nine witnesses recanted testimony against him. And there was never any physical evidence proving that Davis pulled the trigger, resulting in a man's death. Nevertheless, a rush to judgment led to a rush to execution. Meanwhile, just hours before Davis's execution, another man was put to death in Texas. Lawrence Brewer, a white supremacist, was convicted in the 1998 dragging death of a black man, James Byrd Jr. It was one of the most infamous and heinous hate crimes of our time resulting in tougher state and federal legislation. There were no last-minute appeals to spare Mr. Brewer's life, but one powerful principled objection. It came from James Byrd Jr.'s own son. Ross Byrd sought the kind of mercy his father never got. Quote, you can't fight murder with murder. Joining me now is Michelle Alexander, associate professor of law at Ohio State University and author of The New Jim Crow. Professor Alexander, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you for having me. You've got to ask, how many more deaths have got to occur before we fix a system or abandon it altogether? Black people are 10% of the population, and yet 50% of the death row population. Yes, that's right. Studies have shown that those who live and those who die when it comes to the death penalty has more to do with the race of the victim than just about anything else. Uh, those who kill white people are far more likely to be sentenced to death than those who kill black people. Uh, a strong statement about the value that's placed on people's lives according to race in the United States. But what I think is most important today is that we pay honor and tribute not only to Troy's family, but to the countless people who raised their voices in protest, who organized and marched. More than a million people wrote letters, signed petitions, held rallies. And while the major civil rights organizations like the NAACP and Amnesty International and the ACLU played an important role, what I found most inspiring were the small, spontaneous grassroots efforts that emerged on street corners, inside prisons, uh, in churches, in faith communities, uh, among student groups, uh, students against mass incarceration at Howard University. Uh, there was just an un... Uh, believable show right. of unity uh, at this at this tragic moment and what I hope is that the passion uh, and the energy and momentum that was generated to save Troy's life and build a movement to end the death penalty and challenge this system of mass incarceration won't just fade away sure uh, won't be one of these episodic spurts right. um, that we've seen in the past but uh, will actually signal uh, a new phase in the movement to end the death penalty and that uh, we'll be able to look back and see Troy's death as the day when the movement to end the death penalty and the movement to end mass incarceration gain new steam. You know, Michelle, uh, of course, we don't have enough time tonight. We've only got about a minute left. But give me a sense here of the relationship between what we just witnessed and what you've talked about is the new Jim Crow, the over-incarceration of African-American and Latino people in our prisons. There's got to be a relationship between the tough-on-crime stance and the relentless and heartless assault upon vulnerable people of color. That's absolutely right. The utter indifference that the U.S. Supreme Court showed uh, to the uh, likely innocence of Troy Davis wasn't some kind of aberration, but rather a reflection of the fact that our criminal justice system today has uh, shockingly little to do 
with actual justices and has far more to do with being a machine uh, that is destroying the lives of people in communities, particularly poor communities of color. Um, you know, today, you know, it is legal for the police to stop and search, frisk just about anyone, anywhere, without a shred of evidence of any criminal activity as long as they get, quote unquote, consent. Uh, prosecutors are authorized to try to bully people into plea bargains, uh, you know, convicting themselves through confessions, even when they may be innocent by uh, threatening them with mandatory minimum sentences. And the Supreme Court has made it virtually impossible to challenge racial bias at any stage of the criminal justice process, from stops and searches to plea bargaining and sentencing without actual evidence of conscious intentional bias tantamount to an admission. So nothing short of a major social movement is going to end uh, the death penalty in this discriminatory system of criminal injustice. And let's hope that the fight to save Troy Davis's life was just the beginning. Let's hope so indeed. Very compelling. Michelle Alexander, thank you so much for joining us tonight.